guests' time, I'm joined not by one but by two special guests today. Uh, their careers were gloriously entwined right from the word go. And Richard Hill's going for his first English Classic. Harry is going to take it. Charmin is going to be pressed hard by Dushy Antor, but at the line, Charmin wins it! What a triumph for Newmarket, but particularly what a triumph for Willie Haggis, Michael Hills. Strike the front now. unassumingly assembled big race CVs that would be the envy of so many. Michael and Richard Hills joining me here in the studio. Gents, great to see you both. Looking looking well, looking happy and enjoying new careers now, Michael. You're, you're with William Haggis. Richard's still very much involved with, with Shadwell. How do you reflect, Mike, first of all, on, on, those, on those years in the saddle? Together as well. Yeah, it was, it was great fun. Um, you know, uh, we dreamed... Uh, when we were kids, Dad was uh, started training that would be jockeys, and uh, we were very small. And it, you know, it was our it was our, our dream, and uh, we we managed to achieve it. And the great thing was that we sort of were quite level, you know. Uh, I was doing well, Richard was doing well, and you know, it was a it was a good solid career. And obviously, people are intrigued by the bond that that twins have, how you grow up, how you how you develop. Was it from day one obvious that this was the path that that you were going to take, Richard? Well. We figured out pretty early that we weren't doing very well at school, and <laughs> <laughs> we were smaller than everybody else. Who was be- who was better, or you were you pretty much the same in every respect? We were pretty much the same. Um, you know, probably my mother would always say that we probably didn't try that hard. Um, but uh, yeah, it was obvious that you know the path we were going to take, and plus we were in a you know a great position where you know Dad was training, and you know there was a hundred horses outside the house, and that's all we wanted to do really. He is a legendary figure, Barry, um, in, in every respect. He's an absolutely remarkable survivor, but evidently a hard taskmaster. What was, what was it like growing up as, as his sons, but also aspiring jockeys in a, in a racing context? Well, we tried to keep out of the way a bit. <laughs> but um, no, he was great, you know, and, and I obviously went and rode for him for a long time, and Richard rode, but I was, he was my main sort of... 15, 18 years. Um, he was tough, but he was very fair. And once he said something, and you, you certainly knew when he, when he was not happy, um, it was forgotten, and you move on. Mm. And you what, what about as, as young children? Was he, was he present much, or was it just all about the racing? And no, he, You know, owners, and, you know, we, we sort of, as I said, we kept a low profile. Um, but he used to love watch, coming and watching us on the ponies, and we used to follow them up the string. And uh, we had a jockey's table, and um, we used to race basically every 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 morning. Uh, quite expensive ponies, but they soon learn how to be racehorses. Um, and one day, one of them got under the stores, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So is it, yeah, each day there was, you know we followed up and we used to ride a finish and everything else. And then sort of uh, when Dad employed Steve Cawthon was sort of like our. Where we had to, we knew we were at school, but we needed to get out of school because there was a lot more happening back at home, uh, and that sort of got us really going then, uh, when we were just sort of fourteen and a half, fifteen, um, and made that's you know sort of made the change and you know the the, the career that we were going to take. Yeah, because the whole place just became a a more exciting, you know, glamorous environment, I would imagine. What was it like having Cawthon there? Brilliant. Uh, it, Steve, when Steve first came over, he won the guineas tap on wood, and then Dad's horses just they just went off form, so Steve wasn't getting that many rides. So we got him a pony, and so we used to go up to a, a great friend of ours called Charlie Nelson, and we used to go up to his paddocks and we used to race them, and it was great. I mean, he, and Steve uh, when he first came, he bought this fantastic box of kit 
as in goggles, whips, all the sort of American stuff. So every time we rode a winner or rode against him, it was like, can I have a helmet or can I have a pair of goggles or a croup boots? Or, they were a big thing. So, but Steve was fantastic. And he was a young, you know, he's a, sort of only a couple of years older than us. Um, but it, he was, he taught us a lot. And good company. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Top man. I mean, it struck me that you, you, you began your, your careers in, and we've talked about it quite a bit on this programme with, with, with various people, in that golden era, really. You know, Piggott was still in his first incarnation then, and you had Carson and Swinburne and Cawthon and I'm sure I'm leaving Eddery, and I'm sure I'm leaving plenty out besides. What was it like going into that environment? Well, it was amazing because, you know, obviously Pat was riding for Peter Warren, was just down the road. Willie Carson was in and out the house all the time. Lester was obviously dipping in and out when he had a you know a horse that he wanted to ride <laughs> so and and uh, you know my godfather was Greville Starkey was he really so you know we we were surrounded by them and they were they were like our heroes anyway uh, Willie Carson always said that you know of all those names he may not have been ever considered the best jockey of all of them but Starkey was the best judge of a horse he was by far the best judge uh, and he was when we moved to uh, Newmarket shortly after we left school he sort of took a, took us under his wing, really, you know, and drove us around, made sure we got to the races, and introduced us to everybody. And uh, and basically, well, I worked at Tom Jones, where Greville start, where he started. So he put us all on the, you know, on the straight and narrow. And Tom Jones, really, that was your, was that your link to to Sheikh Hamdan? Yeah, I mean, at the time, uh, Michael was very fortunate. In his first ten rides, he rode six winners. So it took me about 50 rides to ride my first winner. Are you sure it wasn't just because he was better? <laughs> Possibly at the time. And then <laughs> he, he had an accident uh, ride now and hurt his hand. And uh, that, uh, I got on one of his rides, and that was my first winner, Border Dawn, for Jeremy Hindley. So the path sort of, uh, Dad, at the end of that year, he said to us, Bright Boys, you know, you can stay here. Uh, or we can get you jobs in Newmarket. Well, you know, we thought Newmarket is the... The place to be, you know, 1,500 horses, and uh, we decided to move to a new market, and that's time, where we went. Time to spread your wings. I was joking, but there is a, there is a sort of serious subtext to it. You, you're, very, you're clearly very close. You've, you've had amazing careers. You've got very comparable CVs in terms of achievement, slightly different, but you know, won lots of big races. Was there difficult internal competition between you at times when one of you was doing really well and one of you wasn't going so well no um i remember when we first started <clears throat> we overheard a conversation and said that the trouble is one's going to be better than the other and we just both looked at each other and went no that's not going to happen you know i knew how he could ride he knew how i could i could ride him you know we we, we you know we we're going to get out and do it make sure we weren't going to be like that and um you know it, but that did stick with us did it and it did, did it spur you on? Did for, it for sure? Did it really motivate you to be yeah. e even better? Yeah, and, and you know when we rode together, I didn't really know where Rich was in the race, but you know when you're out, out of contention, you, I'd always look up or look around to see where he was. And luckily, he was genuine in blue and white, so it was handy to pick him out. <laughs> and quite often, <laughs> quite near the front, because <laughs> that's front. that's the way the boss liked it liked it done, wasn't it? Well, that's right. But also, there's another good thing is that you know if Mike was riding a lot of winners, because he couldn't tell us apart. They didn't really think one of either one was having a bad time, you know. So you could reflect on that. There were at least two of you had two chances of winning a race. So, so you actually played on the, the the general stupidity of most people to not be able to figure who was who. We played on being twins as much as we possibly yeah. could, you know, with owners, uh, you know, because it, it, it was too difficult when an owner come and say, well done, Michael, well done, Richard, to explain if he said the wrong one. I mean, when Michael won the um, Abbey for Robert Sankster, um, uh, <coughs> I went out and got the trophy, and nobody knew, because he was getting changed to cat the plane home. And that can only have been one of about 5,000 occasions when you did this. That's right. <laughs> we did it once at Ascot with Sheikh Hamdam. He, he spotted it straight away. Uh, he just said, there's a, there's a ringer. He's the wrong one. <laughs> I mean, he, was, he was quick. Did you actually go, what, you tried to go and ride one of his horses? No, I was going to get the trophy. <laughs> pick up because Richard was getting ready we were going to kick you know try and beat the last race so we went quick go out and get the trophy like we did in, in France um, and uh, and he spotted it straight away did, now I, I don't want to get into trouble but did you did you ever actually go and ride one that you weren't supposed to ride Nick we couldn't 
we can't divulge that really. <laughs> Put it this way, in, uh, abroad, you know, they found it even more difficult. If we flew to, you know, <laughs> Italy or, you know, Spain. Spain, they didn't have a clue anyway, you know. So, um, <laughs> we, you know, in those days, you could get away with a lot more. I, I did go to America on his passport once. It's only because mine had run out and, uh, and I was never detected. I suppose, yes, no, they weren't biometric passports in those days, were they? No. So the old Irish recognition, you were still, you could just fly through. Yeah, I mean, you know, Michael Hills, Richard Hills, you know, uh, going through the airport wasn't a problem. At the races, it was, you know, Michael or Richard. It depended which one was there. Now, the truth is, you definitely won the derby, didn't you, on Charmin? <laughs> I did. And that, of course, is the great totemic breakthrough moment, isn't it? You know, in any, for any rider. Um, how did you feel when he won the derby? Ah, oh, it's amazing. I mean, I was, you know... It was, a, you know, a, you know, he went in with a chance, or what he thought he had a chance. But no, I was very proud. Um, you know, that's you know the ultimate to win the derby, and uh, it was a great moment. And it's almost unthinkable now that you could go to it with a horse who just had the maiden win for a young trainer who was just establishing himself at the time, William Haggis. You know, we're going back nearly thirty years. Uh, did you go into the race believing that that this was the this was the talent? Yeah, we did. I mean, Willie only had 40 horses at the time, and um, his work was incredible. You know, he, he was working uh, with Henry Cecil's horses, so who, he had the favourite, Dishianti, mm. and he was, he was working better than him. But Willie wouldn't let me ride him work to start with. He just kept his normal rider on. And then he let me ride him work on a racecourse gallop, and he worked fantastic. Um, and Lester was about. Uh, he didn't ride. I think he might have rode him once, but he was about, and he's... Um, took me and showed me all the videos and you know they all sort of this is how you do it sit fifth and pull out and away you go but um he didn't really he said well how many times have you ridden in it I said oh about about six times he said well you know what to do then and that was it and then in the paddock he called me over and I thought hello here we go he's gonna he's gonna tell me how to do it he said when you win I want you to walk back to the winner's enclosure enclosure really slow I went why what? What? He said, because I'm in the director's box and it takes me <laughs> ages to walk down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And, uh, and it, it really um, pushed your career to, a, to another level. William Haggis had to wait an awful lot longer. I think it was quite frustrating for him in a sense that he produced this incredible training performance and it didn't have that instant impact. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, it didn't happen straight away, but... Uh, you know, Willie was always a very, very good trainer, and then the numbers started to come later. And then I think really the turning point for William was when Sheikh Hamdam uh, came on board. Yeah, and of course we saw that with with Baid last year. You've got the race one now, Michael. Yeah, he said I went too soon, but he was, you know, his first his first run of the year, as you said, and he was just out on his legs the last bit and uh, I remember going to see him the next day he could hardly walk but win it he did and that was your that was your derby success back in in 1996 you mentioned that Sheikh Hamdan joined William Haggis's yard we'll talk about Sheikh Hamdan and, and your role with him in a minute Richard with with Shadwell you're now quite an integral part of this same stable Mike with 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 William yeah um just give me a sense of of how that place feels now what the buzz is what what they believe they can achieve well, uh, it's a most amazingly run place, you know, I mean, William and Maureen together. Um, and, you know, everybody's got their job. My, my, my job, I'm in like a little set, the work rider's job. And then other people have got the legs, the, you know, the normal cantering and everything else. It's beautifully run, great people that work there. Um, and uh, it's just really, you know, when, when I retired, he'd just go and... He trained his first hundred winners, and literally it has grown year on and year mm. on since then. And um, you know, it's success. And do you still get the buzz out of that riding these these very classy horses and giving that feedback? Is yeah. that is is that where you get your no, your kicks course. now? Yeah, you know, getting on a nice horse and telling William, you know, I think this is nice, and maybe this would suit Newmarket or maybe Chester next week. Um, that's that's the yeah, that is the thrill and. You know, there's nothing better than getting on a horse and you think, this is just out of the ordinary, this fella. So did you work by Eid quite yeah. regularly? I did nearly all his work. Mm. Um, and, 
you know, he was he was a, a just a lovely horse to deal to be with and to deal with because he was a beautiful ride, and he had so much speed and class. Um, Do you, you know, actually think, in the final analysis, he was a miler? I think he could have won a July Cup. He was that quick. I mean, you know, we taught him to get further, but he, he yeah, he's perfect at a mile. But once we stepped him up and we started to teach him to settle better, mm. you know, he could have got a mile and a half. Yeah, and, and how do you read that, that last performance? Just had enough, just done for the year? Yeah, I think he, the ground was very heavy. And, um, I, it, you know, they can't speak, uh, horses. And I just think he'd just come to the end of his, uh, end of his tether. And for, for you, Richard, it was a very, a very special year, really, for all sorts of reasons. You'd lost Sheikh Hamdan, Sheikh Ahissa really picking up the baton, Shadwell Operation looking very different. How important a horse do you think Baid was for all those reasons? Oh, it was a massive part because um, obviously, you know, when Sheikh Hamdan passed, you know, no, nobody was really sure exactly, exactly what path we were going to take. Uh, and then obviously, you know, Sheikh Ahissa stepped up for her family. Um, and then Bayi came along, and he he sort of gave you know Sheikh Hissa the confidence on the racetrack mm. and with the media and everything else, and she grew with him. Uh, and obviously, the more you know, the more successful he got, and the bigger meetings we got to, you know, the bigger it all became. Um, and for you know, for Sheikh Hamdan's family to have a horse like Bayi, you know, I remember you know he he won so many races, Sheikh Hamdan, but. Whenever you won a classic, you know, it was, it was his goal. But he used to say to me, Richard, he said, the whole of Dubai will come and see me tonight. And that's what was important for him, mm. you know, to people to recognise the, the amount of work and investment he'd done in racing. And it was his, it was his love for racing anyway. But that was a massive part of it. And, uh, and Bayed would have made him very proud. When you were second rider at uh, Shadwell behind Willie Carson, did you believe that you would you would inherit the job? Not really. I mean, I was, I was first jockey for um, Tom Jones, who had about 50 horses for him. So uh, I was actually riding, you know, quite a few of his horses at the time. Mm. And then Dubai came along and Sheikh Mohammed formed Godolphin. Uh, we started going over to Dubai to race during the winter. And, you know, it just started getting bigger. Uh, and then I was retaining the rides when I came back to England um, from the Godolphin uh, setup. So, of course, it was always in your back of your mind. Mm. You want to be first jockey. And, and Willie Carson, he was brilliant with me. You know, I mean, we talked nearly every day about the horses. I was in Newmarket. He was in Lambourne. So he taught me a lot. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, you know, when you got that call to say, you know, will you do it, it was a, a great honour. And, of course, there will be plenty of people who remember you winning races on the second string. Harair being the obvious one in the in the Guineas when well, Willie chose Akareed of uh, of John Dunlops. Did you think to yourself, he's on the wrong one here? Well, no, I'd, <laughs> I'd never ridden either horse. I'd watched them, and Willie was always going to ride Harrier, right? He'd gone down and ridden a work for the and, major. And his relationship with the major. Exactly. You'd have thought he'd have been on her. So then on the Wednesday, before the decorations at Ascot, which is always you know the, the meetings before, he switched. So, of course, I got a phone call from Angus to say, Richard, you are better go down and sit on Harrier on the Thursday to give her a blowout because he always used to work his horses two days before the major. So that's how that came about. Um, and then, you know, she won. <laughs> I think we can take a look at it. This is Harrier in the second Shadwell Colours beating Acca Reed in the first uh, Shadwell Six. They were first and second, weren't they? First and Acca second. Reed was second, yeah. Yeah. And that's the only time I ever rode her. Willie, yeah, no, Willie wouldn't let me go near her again. <laughs> but he, uh, when we went past the line, I could hear him laughing. <laughs> and he came, he was the first person to come up and congratulate me. Frankie there, he was in third. Um, but that was a great day, especially <coughs> for the Major, yeah. Major Hearn. And this Harry, this filly, was from that great family, the family of Nashwan and Anfawain and yeah. Naef, with whom you developed such a great relationship. Was, was Naef the best? you think, that you were associated with over a prolonged period of time? It was probably, he was the most consistent horse I rode. You know, he, he was a tough, consistent horse. And every time you rode him, he, get, he gave you his best, always. You know, he, he wasn't a great worker at home, but on the race course, he was really, really tough. 
Um, and he was, a, you know, he is a big, you know, long ranging, striding horse. Um, and he, 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 I was so upset that he, we couldn't get him there for the derby. But physically, he just wasn't ready at that time. And he, he was knocking heads against some, some very tough horses in, in, in all those races. These are the horses that the public really cleave to. Well, that's right. You know, he, you know, his three-year-old career sort of, sort of went a little bit down. You know, he didn't do so well as a three-year-old. But mm. when he got into a four-year-old and we took him to Dubai, we were training him for the Dubai World Cup um, and that year. Um, and it was only a, 10 days before the World Cup that uh, Sheikh Mohammed and Sheikh Hamdan decided that um, we weren't going to run in the, the World Cup. We are going to run in the Sheena Classic yeah. because of another horse called Saki. Blessing in disguise. So it was a complete blessing in disguise. Um, who... Who do you, you mentioned Saki, and of course he was a brilliant horse, and Frankie kind of reaped the benefits after you'd laid all the groundwork <laughs> for a change. Um, who do you think was the best you rode? What was the most striking feeling you ever had in the saddle? The best, uh, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to win four guineas and three fillies, and Lahan, trained by John Gosden, was the best filly I ever rode. Wow. She, she, she got beat. You'd had a big price about that, wouldn't you, if you'd asked She people. was 20 to 1 on the day. Uh, yeah. she, got, she was finished last in the Fred Darling at Newbury. It was bottomless ground, and we were all desperately, uh, you know, uh, disappointed on how she ran, and she, didn't, she hadn't come in a coat. It was the first year John went down to Manton. Um, anyway, you know, she came out of that race, and she worked extremely well the week before. But the feel I got off her was amazing. I mean, she picked, when I asked her to go, just going down into the dip, she just went past the horses like they were nothing. I mean, it's the best turn of foot. She was always a very keen, free-running free running filly. But yeah, a good shot of it here, of us scything through the You back. see her go through there, and that was, she just glided straight through them. And she'd only just started coming to herself. Um, and she went and won, well, she won easily. And then after that, we worked to the week before uh, the Irish Guineas, and uh, they were all, you know, uh, Ben Sanks to everybody, and they said they hadn't seen a horse work as good as that since Rodrigo De Niro had worked there before. Um, Rodrigo De Triano, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, unfortunately, she had an accident in her box and never ran again. What a shame, an unfulfilled talent. Lahan, to date, John Gosden's only Guineas winner, uh, back in the year 2000, the millennium year, for Richard Hills in the Sheikh Hamdan colours. Um, Michael, if you were to be remembered by the exploits of, of one horse. It might not be Sharma, it might not be Pentai, who was a brilliant middle distance horse. It might be further flight though, mightn't it? No, uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I rode 22 winners on him. 22? 22 winners. And he was around for uh, nine years, and um, he was amazing. Five yeah. Jockey Club five Cups. Five Jockey Club it, Cups it was then. On, the, on the bounce. An e-ball, which was great, and... Um, uh, Longsdale Cup and two Goodwood Cups. He's an incredible horse. And are you quite happy to be remembered for him? Yeah. Even though he probably wasn't the classiest horse you rode, but... No, 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 he was, but he, yeah, oh, no, definitely. Because, uh, you know, the way he raced, you know, you had to come late. and It was tr quite a tricky ride, really. Um, you know, if you got there too soon, because he was quite keen. Um, but he was, yeah, he, he was my pal. He was your pal. Yeah. And this is the 91 Goodwood Cup. And you've got him nicely covered up here in the Wingfield Digby colours, the, the lime green with the black sleeves. Yeah. Got a bit too much daylight here, haven't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> Did he come too soon again, Mike? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is when he's younger. But when he, um, Greville Starkey rode him, and I think Willie Carson rode him as well. And then I got on him, and he won. And then Dad sent me up to air to ride him, and gave me the instructions and said, you know, just the e is in mind and keep that in your mind don't win too far basically so I said right okay I went all the way up to air and he won and as I came in the winning enclosure there was dad and Robert Sangster they just came onto the race course they didn't want anybody to know that they were there really <laughs> in the winning enclosure <laughs> yeah that's fantastic and and did did you get a lot of praise from your dad when you were riding for him or not not really no um well done, and next day, do it again. You know, he used to say to me, um, he used to say, good jockeys make things happen. Go out and do it. 
and that was all he needed. Did you get told when you got it wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure, because it meant a lot to him and, you know, everybody, yeah. He, and, but then it was forgot, you know, and then it was, you know, move on. It was hard when I was young, when I first started riding for him, because, you know, you'd take it home with you. And, but I learned how to deal with it. And, um, you know, uh, it's hard for any jockey, you know, mm. to take criticism. And, you know, especially with the young ones now, they have social media. You know, we didn't have as much social media in them days. But uh, you've got to learn how to take them, you know, the good days, the bad days. Um, turn the page, new page tomorrow, you know, or half an hour later there's another ride. Um, get on with it. Did you feel, or do you look back on it now and feel like you had the best of it? Um, I think, you know, you know, we were saying that I thought, you know, you'd ask what it was like then and now. I think it's much the same. It's easier now that you only do one meeting. It was tough doing two meetings. Um, but um, Do you agree with that? Do you think that's... I do agree thing? with it, yeah. yeah. Because the jockeys have more of a life and, um, you know, they can plan their, their days where, you know, when you're coming back late and doing two meetings and driving like a loony across the country to get to another meeting, um, it's hard. And you're late, it's early mornings and late nights. So at least you get a chance to spend more time with your families. Um, you, you both have a, a very close relationship with, with Frankie Dottori. Richard, particularly, you would, would have spent a lot of time with him here and in, in, in Dubai. The, the longevity of his career is pretty extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we pretty much spent, well, I spent most of my riding career with him and went around the world with him, I don't know how many times. And, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a dedicated guy. And I think um, over the last couple of years, you know, that, you know, the age does get to you, you know, it's doing it every day and, you know, getting in the sauna, keeping your weight and, you know, you're competing against, you know, 18, 19 or 20 year olds, you know, and you get to that sort of 50 years old. But, I think what's regenerated him this year particularly was his trip to America. Um, and he, I never, you know, he called me most every other day or whatever, pretty close we were. And you, I could feel it in his voice. And also, he suddenly started dropping his weight, which, you know, normally he'd always be 8, 11, sort of, mm. in, during the winter, sort of just under nine stone. Oh, he was, he was extraordinary. In, well, in he'd California. be ring, ringing me up and he'd be sweating like that. And then he'd show me the scales and he was 8'4", you know. And uh, I think that just completely regenerated him. Uh, and he was, I watched every one of all these races, like, you know, the next day, because you get it on the replays. And he was riding extremely well. I mm. mean, he really, he's really got a taste for it again, you know? And to what extent did, did people feed off his, his energy in the way? I mean, he'd be the first person to say he would, he would rev people up the wrong way sometimes just by, by that ebullience. But that obviously wasn't the case with you guys. Well, no, I had to, you know, sit next to him. He was the first man that ever kissed me, which was a, <laughs> took a bit of taking. And when anything happened, he wrote a win. You know, he, he's very up and down. Um, but, you know, Pat was about two doors away from us. We had Wally next to us as well. And Frankie, you know, this young kid, he, these big hands, and he was always knocking over the tee and doing something. He just brought life to the whole thing you know in the wearing room when I first got into the wearing room when we were kids it was you know there were rules that you had to abide by and you know he suddenly changed all that you know from you know the way he behaved that sort of you know Italian you know mindset on everything uh, and brought a bit of fresh you know for me fresh air to the whole atmosphere of the wearing room. You talked about you. You raised an eyebrow, Michael, when when Richard was talking about young kids coming in and making you kind of feel your age when you when you're when you're growing as as jockeys. It drives me looking back on your careers, though, that that reputationally, you you might have been in a better position toward the end than you were were at the beginning. You'd had to earn it quite hard. Yeah, but you know when you when you start breaking through into the, the bigger, better rides and that, you know, and then you've got to stay there. There's always a new, in, a new apprentices coming along and new young kids coming along, snapping at your heels. Um, but that's what, makes, that's what makes you fight, you know, fight to keep it. I guess it's like a footballer. Mm. You know, they see some good guy sat on the bench. I'm going to have to play better here to keep this guy, otherwise he's going to come on and take me off. I see this is bad, and this is the bit where I can't remember. Who retired first? I did. By how long? Uh, the yeah. World Cup meeting, mm. the start of the year, and I retired at the end. 
And so how was it for you when he'd gone? Yeah, very strange. Um, because we, 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 you know, John Robinson, who booked our rides, drove us every day. Um, fantastic, John, um, for 30 years. And then suddenly I was going racing on my own. And, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was strange. It was, um, it, was, it, was, it was empty, you know. Um, yeah, very weird. Did you discuss the end with each other or couldn't you? No, um, Rich rang me up and told me about, I think it was the week before the World Cup, that he was, that's what he was going to do. And I was, oh, God, that means I'm going to have to retire, is it? You know, then. <laughs> um, but no, we didn't really, he told me a week before and that was it. And you couldn't even go and pick up the trophies? Oh. <laughs> what? So what prompted the decision for you? With me, I got to you know a point where um, you know I'd been working as first jockey for Sheckham for 18 years, and uh, and I always wanted to work with Shadwell after racing, uh, and it was always whether the right time to to do it. And I'd spoken to Sheckham Dam and discussed it with him, and we felt that that was the right time. I was 48 years old, uh, and uh, didn't think I had a particularly good bunch of horses the following year, so I wanted to go out on top. And, and so, Michael, you, you're going into the wang room for the rest of the year. Just, it just didn't feel the same, didn't it no, feel right? No, it didn't. Feel, no, it didn't. It felt different. But, um, you know, I got on a really good filly. My dad had, uh, Charlie had a, uh, just a judge. Mm. And um, I thought, oh, of course, I like this filly. You know, she, was, she won three races and I won the Rockville. And uh, then she changed owners. And so I, I knew I was going to lose the ride the following year because Jamie Spencer was retrained by Sheikh Fard. And that sort of just tipped it for me, you know. I, you know, I thought, right, that's it, let's go. And Charlie is now uh, having a a fantastic run of it. I mean, this year and, and particularly the back end of last season have been have been really excellent. Uh, are you pretty confident in the future of, of Farringdon Place? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Batash, um, you know, he's he's had some wonderful horses and well, you Bahara, know, Batash. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, he's got some. He's had a good start. He had a great year last year. You know, you're just you're always looking for that good horse just to... And they're hard to replace. I mean, like, you know, it's going to be hard for William to... Baid, he leaves a bit of a gap. I mean, you, you look at his box and there's someone else in it and you think, oh, you know, they're hard horses to replace. I, um, I think Charlie enjoyed it last year. I told him I think that there were only three trainers in the world who'd had more than one horse in time forms top 20 this, this millennium or something, and they were John Gosden... Bob Baffert and Charlie Hills. I bet he liked that. <laughs> he enjoyed that. You can imagine he enjoyed yeah. that. But he's had a tremendous amount of success, Charlie. You know, um, and he's you know he's it's taken him a while to get to where he is now. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it strikes me he he we t- talking about people kind of wearing their success like he does wear his success quite lightly, doesn't he? He's not a sort of no. he's not a big chest puffed out character is he no he's not he's not but i mean you know which is nice yeah and when you actually see black and white what he's done and how many group one winners he's had you know um you know obviously it's been a massive help having father there you know looking after everything bollocking him every day and you know the and also a great staff members of the staff that have been there probably 20 years you know uh and you know pretty much the, those horses you know they they know the gallops they know what speed they should be going. You know, it's just a matter of just picking the right races and just getting them there fit and well. But uh, he's got a good, good bunch of horses this year. But we've seen dynasties rise and we've seen dynasties fall. It's very easy to mess it up, isn't it? Hundred percent. You yeah. know, you can ha- you can be you can be you can inherit the earth, but it's pretty and it's easy to. always going to get judged by you know the achievements that Dad did as well. You know, so that's another added pressure um, that he has to deal with. You know, and uh, you know I think he's done fantastic. And for you both now, just reflecting on, on what horse racing has, has given you, and, and your own bond is very strong, but clearly the sport has strengthened it yet further. Um, would you have changed anything? No. No, no. I mean, you know, we've been, uh, you know, very lucky. I've, you know, I was lucky to meet, you know, Sheikh Hamdam and, you know, he, from... When I was 18 years old, I rode my second winner for him, you know, and pretty much my whole career, I worked for for him and uh, and the Maxim family, um, and we've, you know, I've been around the world and met some fantastic people, ridden some brilliant horses. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give one minute up for anything. 
you mentioned Sheikh Hamdan. Um, you speak so warmly of him, so fondly of him, but clearly someone with, who set very exacting standards, expected a certain standard of professionalism and, and ability. Mike, you've worked for your father for a long time. Jeff Rag was another senior trainer you had huge amounts of, of success for. Um, it seems to me that you, you both have pretty significant resilience and ability to withstand plenty. I think you have to, you know. It's, 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 look, it's great being a driver, but, you know, you have some tough days and some things to deal with, and, you know, you've got to look after your weight, your fitness. That's why Frankie, you know, you really got to take your hat off to him because he's, you know, he's stuck in there and he's been at that top level for so, so long. Um, you know, he's 50, 52, isn't he? Yeah. It takes some doing, to keep turning up. And just keeping on, yeah. keeping on. But, you know, we, you know we, we were old school, really. Tom Jones is pretty tough, you know, as a, when I was an apprentice there. And, you know, Dad always checking up. You know, you, as, as Michael said, you know, he wrote for him a lot more than I did. But, you know, if you got any praise from him, you, you know, it really made you appreciate what you've done and, and to achieve more, to make him proud. Um, but it's a tough game, this, you know. You've got to, you know, one race to another race or whatever. You know, you ride a bad race in the first race. It doesn't mean you're going to ride a bad race in the last race. And you've got to have that mindset. And, it's, and it, once it's done, it's done. You can't change anything, you know. And I think good jockeys have to have that mindset. And you're both still involved with a lot of good horses. And with all that experience comes that significant judgment you were talking about earlier with a horse like Baid. Where's the next one? Yeah, uh, yeah, the next one. Um, you know, there's lots of nice horses there. We've got a lovely filly uh, had an injury last year called Sense of Duty. Mm -hmm. And I like her. She's going to be a sprinter, you know, in the sprinting uh, this year. Um, but there's a few hidden in there. No, that's not the answer I was after. <laughs> it's the answer that Willie Haggis would tell me to give. Well, the thing is, the fact that you're still able, quite happily, to call him Willie and can get away with it means that you're in a very privileged position. He's good at making a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, he's great. He's been a real pal. William, um, when I went to Jeremy Hinley at 17, William was assistant a, a pupil assistant, and his first job was to book my rides. How did he get on? He was good. He was good great. at that as well. Yeah, he was How good annoying. at that. Yeah. <laughs> and your relationship is obviously a fantastic one. Yeah, and he's a, a great friend. And, you know, we've uh, sort of grown together in our careers. And, you know, it was, I've always lived in Newmarket, so I was never really going to go back to Lambourne. And it was just a natural thing. I, I, you know, when I told William I was going to give up, I said, give us a job. He said, of course, Mike, come here. There you go. And it worked out beautifully. And so, of course, your kind of paths are crossing a bit, as we discussed with the whole Baid thing. So if Mike won't tell me who the next flying machine is, you're going to tell me who the next flying machine is. Well, I'd mind, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, our three-year-olds weren't that good, our two-year-olds weren't good, that good last year. So we haven't really got any real top-class three-year-olds coming through this year. But obviously we have Hookham mm -hmm. uh, and Mac. And obviously, you know, Mustadaf has done so well this year in Saudi Arabia and then in Dubai. And they're really our flagships. Uh, we've got some nice fillies that just ran once, maybe won a race, so they got to prove themselves. Uh, but I hope we've got a really nice bunch of two-year-olds. Um, that, that, uh, of all the mares that we kept, uh, are so beautifully bred in all you know, the height of fashion line, uh, which we've kept. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing some nice horses come out. And Anne Mart uh, was going to run at Sandown at the abandoned fixture on Friday. Will he go to Newmarket for the rescheduled race against yeah. Adar? Yeah, because it's great that they've switched it for us. So that's on Sunday. Could he beat Adar? Do you think? Well, you know, he's got to prove that he's a Group One horse. He's done it at uh, Group Three and Group Two level. Uh, I think if we can beat it, it'd be over a mile a quarter. I think we could get beyond a mile a quarter, but I think he's a pretty smart horse over ten furlongs, uh, and he's in real good form. So we give him a good run for his money. And great to have Hookham back. We didn't think that was likely after the Coronation Cup last well, Jim year. Jim rode him work uh, two days ago and he said he never felt better. So we were lucky that that injury happened, but didn't had, you know, it could have been so much worse, obviously having an injury in a race like that. But the, you know, the vets and everything were so pleased with how everything went. And he's such a perfect you know, patient. So fingers crossed he's got a good year ahead of him. And if you guys could come out of retirement to ride uh, some horses next weekend, who would you like to who would you like to get on? Yeah, um, I mean, look, 
we didn't really get to see him in the Greenham, but you know, I think Frankie's got a good ride. You know, also when the uh, yeah, you know, he'd done nothing wrong. Um, it was a good solid run, um, and uh, he's t he looks tough, and he looks like a horse that could suit Newmarket, mm -hmm. and I think that's a big plus. And what about the what about the fillies? Anything that's catch your eye? To I think it's very meditate? open. It's very open, the Phillies. I think the trials are going to be important. Yeah. I think uh, over the last few years, you know, the Guineas, for the 1,000 Guineas, Phillies that had a run has made a big difference. And we've had a really cold spring. Good, yeah. So I'd be looking to... So you think the trial would be an advantage this 100%. time more than in other years? Yes, I do. I really do. And especially those Phillies, you know, that ran um, at Newbury and, and at Newmarket. Um, yeah, I think for the Colts, I would love to see the King win. I think that would be the best. And I saw him work, actually, at Slip Newmarket. The pen. Yes, I saw him work at Newmarket, and I thought he looked pretty good. Um, and James was really happy with him, John. And it's about time John had another Guineas winner, because it was a long time ago he had <laughs> yes, his last one. I'm sure he loves being reminded of it. <laughs> I do often remind him of it, I do. Do you think he would say, and I'm sure I've discussed this with him, but it's been a while since he's been on, um, do you think he would say he's training for the depth of the season and... Then you've got the flip side of the coin. Aiden wants the Guineas winners. I mean, he's won everything else as well, but he, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. If I you're making stallions, I, th I think that to win the Guineas, it's important. And then John, you know, he he trains horses every year to win the Guineas, and it's just unfortunate. You know, even Kingman was unlucky. Mm. You know, I mean, he's he's been close, and with all those fillies, Ravens Pass, Kingman. Ra yeah, I mean, they've all been knocking on the door. I mean, it, it, it's a tough race to win. Um, I don't think I think you know he's trained those horses to win that race, not just for the you know the year, but obviously you know they got to last. Um, and I think you know the weather does play a big part of it. Yeah. I, I... Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.